Yeah. Let's yeah. rock. Welcome to the 36th episode of The Smartest People in the Room. If you've been following this series, you understand what we are doing, shining a light on incredibly smart, accomplished people and helping them share stories from their careers and lives, as well as anecdotes about their past, present, and future. Today, I am pleased to welcome two highly accomplished and well-known respected music tech superstars to our program. Before we get started, let me take care of a little bit of business. First, to the audience, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat window. The reason we do these webinars is twofold. First, we wanna showcase really smart people and the amazing work that they do day to day in the industry. But the second reason is a bit more nuanced. Some of you know that I am a music industry headhunter. By definition and function, I help people connect with companies. In this series, my goal is to help you make more connections and I invite you to take full advantage of that opportunity. Specifically, I invite you to engage with the speakers and the other attendees in the chat of the Zoom. Please introduce yourselves, say hello to your friends and make some new ones and ask questions of our speakers. We will try to address as many of those as possible during the interview. Before we get started, let me thank our sponsors for without their support, we couldn't do what we do. I wanna thank First Horizon Bank, Bufkin Baker, Fairlane Hotel, Core Power Yoga, Create Tennessee and the Tennessee Entertainment Commission, Lightning 100, Tennessee Brew Works, Four Roses Bourbon, Moo TV, Jive Printing, Project Music, and I'm also pleased to welcome a new sponsor today, Cushmasters Relief, which is a really cool brand of CBD products. More on that later. So let's get down to business. Today's interviewer is my good friend, Dick Wingate. Dick is principal of Dev Advisors, a digital entertainment consulting firm that provides expertise to technology companies, content owners, artists, and investors. With more than 40 years of experience in the music and interactive industries, Dick helped pioneer the digital music business from its infancy as SVP of content development at Liquid Audio Incorporated, playing an integral role in their 1999 IPO and negotiating the first digital download licenses from the major record labels. He subsequently served as president, media development and chief content officer at Nelly Moser, an early provider of streaming and mobile apps with clients such as Warner Music, MTV, AT&T, Sony, and ABC TV. His positions in the record industry included SVP of Marketing at Arista Records, SVP of A&R at Polygram Records, Director of Talent at Epic Records, and Director of Product Management at Columbia Records. He's been featured or quoted in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Wall Street Journal, Time USA Today, New York Times Magazine, and Billboard. Dick has also been granted a lifetime membership to Neris. Welcome, Dick. Thank you, Tom. And thanks for having me on the program. Right on, brother. And joining Dick as today's featured guest is Ty Roberts. Ty has shaped the digital entertainment world since he first began developing games in the 1980s. He went on to be part of the team that created QuickTime to launching the first interactive albums and other innovative music products with his team at Ion for artists including David Bowie, Todd Rundgren, and Primus. In 1998, Ty co-founded GraceNote and served as chief strategy officer for nearly 18 years. GraceNote's music and TV metadata powered services offered by major consumer electronics and audio companies around the world, including iTunes, Comcast, Ford, and Mercedes. Ty guided the company from three to 1,700 people, ultimately managing a $100 million P&L as GM of music before GraceNote was sold to Nielsen in 2016. Ty was then named the first chief technology officer for Universal Music Group, driving partnerships for high-res audio streaming and working with artist teams to develop immersive experiences such as Hologram and Dome. Over the past several years, he's focused on strategic advising for Jay-Z's title, the award-winning Hi-Fi Audio Company, MQA Limited, and others. As co-founder of Fantrax Digital LLC, he's now working to transform the live streaming experience to one that delivers the highest levels of music and video production along with immersive interactive elements that elevate the performance beyond what a traditional live show can deliver. Please welcome these two amazing guests to the smartest people in the room. Take it away, boys. Thanks, Tom. Great to be here. I'm really excited to be here with Dick as well. 
Yeah, it's great. I, I when Tom uh, asked me to do one of these, uh, he said, "Well, who who do you want to who do you want to talk with?" And the first person that came to my mind was was Ty, and so I'm really happy that it worked out. And and at first he said to me, "Do you want to do it on?" Um, I have a, a November, I have November third or November fifth available, and I said, "No, I don't want to do it on on the week of the election. Let's just you know." Let's do it the following week. So I think that's worked out well. Um, and thanks everybody for for uh, coming in. I see lots of familiar faces and names over here in the in the list, and I really ap appreciate uh, the attendance. So I thought maybe we could start by you know talking about each of us about what got us uh, engaged with technology, and so I'll ask. I'll ask uh, Ty to, to start and, and then I'll tell my story. Thanks, Dick, for that. Well, yeah, I guess for me, I was a bad musician. I was a trombone player, which was a pretty hard instrument actually to learn. Uh, and uh, I, so I knew a little bit about music, but the, the thing I was really interested in was this new thing called video games. I was one of the guys who, you know, was right there at the beginning of the Atari VCS and these kind of things. And so I, wanted to write video games. And um, I did write video games. I wrote them for those early systems, but my games were really not that good. You know, at that time, a, a game team was about three people, maybe four people, like an art person, a game designer, programmer, and then like a tester. And uh, so I made a couple games, uh, but the part of the game that I really enjoyed doing was the part that made the sounds and the bleeps and the bloops. So that turned out to be bleeps and bloops to start, but then pretty soon computer technology got better and they could actually generate music. And so I became the guy who made the sound engine, which is what it was called, those guys are the sound driver for games. And, um, uh, and to make the music, once we had music, you had to enter it somehow. And so I made a notation editor where you could put notes on the screen of the computer and you could put that into the game. And, uh, uh, the musicians who were making the music said to me, you know, this whole thing is fun to do music for games, but like, I don't really want to do music for games. I want to do music for music. Can you just get rid of the whole game part <laughs> and just make a thing, <laughs> just think the thing where I can like put music in and put it onto my record. And I was like, well, that's got very interesting. And that turned out to be people like Herbie Hancock that turned out to be people like Todd Rundgren and other people who were using the first generation computers to compose. And uh, that's what got me into it was, you know, making tools for artists to make music. And uh, that's how I started. How about you, Dick? What, how did you get into this? Well, so I, you know, I had a, a lengthy career in the mainstream music business uh, before I got into technology. So my, my career has been kind of in two equal parts. They're each, you know, 20 plus years. And, um, but and initially, you know, my, I've been a, I was never, I was never a musician. I couldn't read or write or play music, but uh, as a kid growing up, I, I was obsessed with the, the radio and obsessed with, with music. And I, I listened to, to the, to my transistor radio, just any, every moment of the day, I used to look, actually go out and get the, the physical playlists that the top, top 40 station in New Haven printed and distributed and study those, you know, and I'm like 11, 12 years old, I'm studying the playlist. So I had that interest. And then I was lucky enough uh, as a teenager, again, to, to be able to see iconic bands like The Doors and Cream and, you know, The Rolling Stones early on and others. And so I was hooked on music, but I never thought of it as, as a career until I got to uh, college and I was uh, at the Brown University and my roommates who said, I always did the best, I always spun the best records in, in, in my room because you know we would host each other in our rooms in the dorms. They said, you, you should be going up to the radio station. You should be the deep, you should go on, get on the air. And so that literally was like that light bulb went on and I went up and I got on the air at, at WBRU in Providence, Rhode Island, which was the biggest, uh, uh, highest rated FM station in Rhode Island. It actually had a 50,000 watt signal. So it was college operated, but a commercially licensed station. And, and so I, I, you know, that, that was the beginning of it for me. And, you know, 
from there, I went into the record business and I was a product manager at Columbia Records, where I was lucky enough to work hands-on and write the marketing plans for artists like Bruce Springsteen and Elvis Costello and Peter Tosh and Pink Floyd and, and many others. It was an extraordinary experience. I was very young and, and just was in the middle of the, the greatest artists of some of the greatest artists of the of the 20th century as it as it turns out from there i went into a and r at epic records uh where i spent seven years signing and making records and learning production uh not so much that i was twiddling the knobs i always i always hired great engineers like bob clear mountain to do the, to do that and uh producers would, i was lucky enough to discover amy mann and, and signed her band till Tuesday and had had a top 10 hit and had had a, a top 10 hit with Eddie Grant, uh, Electric Avenue, some some pretty iconic songs and, and um, great experience with bringing uh, licensing music into the United States as well with uh, st the iconic punk new wave label called Stiff Records, which was who, who discovered Elvis Costello. <laughs> and um, I won't repeat their tagline, but I do know what it is. Yeah. If it ain't, if it ain't stiff, it ain't worth a yeah. damn. Right. Yeah. Actually, actually, they have some of the greatest slogans in the history of the music business. So I have a, you can't see it, but over me, I have a vinyl clock. It's an, actually an album with, with hands that are battery operated. It says, Stiff Record says, when you kill time, you murder success. They had a, they had a phrase for everything. Yeah. Right. Um, and uh, from there, I went on to become the head of A&R at Polygram Records, a uh, great era of rock, Def Leppard, Bon Jovi. Uh, oh, all the Stephen, acts I'm working with today, Dick. Yeah, Kiss, uh, <laughs> Scorpions. Uh, yeah, Have Spandex and Mullet, we'll oh, travel. Oh, oh my <laughs> God, it was just, we just <laughs> sold tens of millions of records. But, you know, that, that era came to an end at the end of the 80s and... Um, and so this is where I turn to, this is now I'm up to the moment that you asked about. And that is, you know, after uh, I left Polygram, I, I wasn't really sure if I wanted to be still going to clubs every night, because frankly, that's the way you did A&R. You would listen to mountains of cassettes and yeah. you went to clubs every night. I, I hated smoke and I, and you know the clubs were still unregulated in terms of smoking i would go to cbgb's and i would come back and my clothes would just reek of cigarette smoke and i wasn't sure i wanted to do that anymore after doing that for 10 years and i was you know kind of just uh taking some time to regroup and i through a family member they turned me on to a company that had developed an interactive music previewing station called the i station the company was was called In Touch Group out of San Francisco. And it was really high tech. It was a touchscreen operated uh, music system that allowed you to listen to any music in the record store before you bought it, which sounds so mundane today, but it was revolutionary at the time. And um, you would rate the songs and it also required a free card, which was unique barcode based on four demographic questions. So we knew who was listening to what music and how they were rating it. Uh, all this is, we're talking 1991. You know, this is well before music was- so on Joshua radio. Kaplan and, uh, yeah, Josh you know, Kaplan. Grace Noah was founded with a number of his employees and uh, because we were in Berkeley and he right. was in Berkeley. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And, and, uh, so and, there's a deep connection to that iStation being in the first, I call it database of music information. So it was, and there were no such thing as digital assets. So we had to rip CDs and create handcrafted, right. handcrafted 30 second samples, you know, no, no algos it was a 24 hour operation, three shifts of eight hours of students from the San Francisco <laughs> Music Conservatory who would spend that. all day and, and, and do that. And, you know, the, the, the albums well, would come in from the record companies in pallets. You know, they would just drop pallets of, of CDs at the door. I mean, that was, that was. Well, I know, I know that we, you know, I want to think about like when we actually met first and, and while yeah. I, that's actually a really good connection, that's a little bit later. Um, so I want to talk about BMG and um, yeah. 
you know, so, you know, what happened is music tools for me turned into uh, tools for artists to visualize their music. And Todd Rundgren happened to be my neighbor. I lived in, you know, Marin County and he was living in Sausalito at the time. And eventually I moved down the street from him. And um, he was a big person in charge of like computer graphics and, and interactivity. And he had this idea that we could make an interactive album using computers and using, you know, this kind of technology. And so we prototyped kind of what I'll call like Todd's music listening room, where you could go into his room and there are all these objects and you can do whatever. And um, uh, that is an early demonstration of interactivity around an album. And that led to me finding some partners, Ann Greenberg and her uh, at the time husband, John Greenberg and Lou Beach to form ION. And we had this idea that we were gonna make interactive experiences, but they were gonna be beyond, they were gonna be like video things. We had like a cop demonstration for like cops. We had like music ones, we had all different ones. And um, we decided the music was probably the most, the industry that was gonna move quickest. So we decided to focus on that. and. Uh, lo and behold, uh, we managed to get, uh, you know, first I started searching for rock stars. You can imagine a computer guy, kind of know a few. Todd, Herbie Hancock, they were interested, but they weren't quite big enough to get the uh, funding that we needed for the business. And so I had uh, another guy that I met and we kind of chased down Peter Gabriel and got to England and, you know, went to his studio and convinced him that he should do the CD-ROM thing, that this was gonna be the new album. And he fully embraced it. He was like, I'm doing it, I'm doing puzzles, I'm like gonna do all these things. The only problem was that his manager guy at the time, who will remain nameless, um, came to me and said, this is a great idea, Ty, we love this, but you're gonna do this all for work for hire. Just like a studio musician, you're gonna come in, we're gonna pay you and be done. I was like, well, wait a minute, no, I'm an entrepreneur. I have like patents and ideas and I wanna have my own company. And oh, no, 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 we don't want any of that. Peter's gonna own this and do whatever. and. Peter really didn't want to do any of these things. It was the manager guy that wanted to do all that. But the but the reality is I left England going, oh, there's no way for me to work with Peter Gabriel. And um, uh, I told this story before, but basically what happened is there was an engineer in Peter's studio that worked for David Bowie. He was one of David's engineers. And he left the studio after seeing the demonstration we showed and called David up and said, you got to find out about this Ty Roberts guy, this new CD-ROM thing. Peter's going to do it. He's been talking to other people. And so I got back to California and uh, my phone rang and, you know, normally my phone's ringing, but I pick up the phone. There's an English gentleman online says, hello, this is David Bowie. I'd like to talk to you about this interactive multimedia yes. thing. I'm like, I knew immediately it was David Bowie. You didn't think you were being, <laughs> I thought you didn't it was, think you were... was very, very similar to what I may have heard on TV or something. I said, okay, what do you know? And he told me what the guy had told him. And he said, can you come to New York and talk about this? And so this is how I got to BMG, because when I got there, you know, he was into it. He was like, look, I want to be first in the medium. You know, I'm the guy. I have a film mind. I want to, I can act. I can do whatever. Like, what can we do? I said, well, let's think about what we're doing. And he said, well, how is Peter doing this? I said, well, Peter's going to pay for it. And I said, well, he said, whoa, 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 whoa. He says, I'm David Bowie. I don't pay for anything. He said, what I do is I go to my record company and they pay for everything. He said, let's go there tomorrow. And so we went, I went with David Bowie to... BMG, which is the record company you were at, and pitched the CEO and the CFO and I don't know who else, you know, on this crazy idea. And David said that he was into it. And then he left the meeting and left me in there with these guys. And um, they said, OK, we want to do this. Do you have a business plan? I was like, sure. I didn't have a business plan. I, uh, <laughs> I went to the Mac store in New York and bought Business Plan Builder. It was like some spreadsheets you could buy for like 30 bucks. And me and Ann and John, whatever, we worked over the weekend and we got a business plan together. And I showed up on Monday morning and they said, how much is going to need? And I said, I don't know, $5 million. They were like, great, you got it. We'll give you $5 million and a joint venture and you have your own label. And, uh, you know, thanks a lot. And uh, we ended up starting ION, which was the first interactive label. And one of, you know, there were other people doing this as well. I don't want to say I was the only guy doing it, but the reality is that got me in business. And those guys at BMG did a lot to help get computers and music going in the nineties. Yeah. Um, and, and I met you. So I, you know, I was now by, by 1996, I was at BMG. I yep. spending two years at Arista as the head of marketing. Um, we're, we're just and, coming out with Todd and Primus and these enhanced yeah, CD things. And and I remember, I remember you coming in 
to a conference room at 1540 Broadway and demonstrating I, uh, CDDB. Yeah. And, you know, wasn't that around, around 96 or so? So we called it Go CD. It was before, yeah. it was before CDDB, which was some, another guy, Steve Sheriff, that, I, that Ann and I had met. But we had this idea that we didn't need to have the interactive stuff on the CD-ROM. But there was this new thing called the internet. And what you would do is you put the CD in your computer, it would look up its home in a database to say, this is the URL that goes with this CD, and then it would load the visual experience. That was the idea. And that became the, the basis for kind of like CD recognition leading to media and information. And yes, we did come there. That. And by the way, Bertelsmann said, um, at that time they were like, you know what? We're gonna go into video games. We're not that interested in this internet thing. We don't see it actually at that time. They said, we don't see an intersection between computers and music. I was told that by executives who remain nameless. Uh, and uh, uh, they said, how would you like to have your company back for a dollar? And we'll give you the patents for this thing that you just showed us. And we were like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we left. And those patents and that stuff became some of the foundational elements of Grace Note and CDDB. And that that is... Uh, Bertel's been let us go. It wasn't great because they also let the cash go. So we didn't have all the money either, but we did make it and we did get into this new venture and um, transition from disks to the internet. Miraculous. Well, it was a disk oriented business because while I was at BMG, I negotiated a deal with AOL to put the AOL software onto BMG disks in a second session, a multi session. Yeah. And uh, was able to negotiate a deal to get several pennies for every disc. And this was in the age of shipping millions and millions and millions of records. That's right. And I can say it now, there's no one left at AOL to, to be embarrassed, but you know, I, they kept sending back drafts of contract and, and it, it, it never said, I, I kept waiting for them to, to change shipments, the word shipments to net shipments. Yes. In the, and they never <laughs> did. So, when we shipped 5 million Wu-Tang albums and took like 2 million back, we got paid on 5 million by AOL. Anyway. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, but, yeah it, but, BMG, I, I, but BMG was a turning point for, for both of us because um, that's where I met Liquid Audio. They, they came in and I, I, one of my jobs at BMG was to, to vet all these technology companies that were coming in in the early days you know, Real Audio, which was called Progressive Networks when I first met them. And yeah. and Microsoft's first streaming product was called NetShow. It wasn't called Windows Media um, and Liquid Audio and others. And then I went on, uh, Liquid Audio sold me away from BMG. And, you know, and I, for the next three and a half years, we, we built, uh, we kind of cleared the land for digital downloads by negotiating what the first licenses were virtually every major label, including Universal, and uh, and selling digital music, albeit at a very early stage, to at powerrecords.com and, you know, cdnow.com and Borders and Best Buy and Barnes & Noble and pretty much every retailer, but it was, it was very early. And, well, that, you know, all of those first, you know, digital downloads, let's call it the 2000 era digital download services, paved the way for, you know, what we have today, but the, the principal thing was to get it going. And, you know, um, interesting stuff happened during that time, as we know, you know, Napster came around and basically that was a huge thing, which was scared the record business that people were just gonna pirate all the music. And so that led to DRM, you know, rights management, the files being locked to your computer and your device, which made the digital download business more complicated. And, and we, I think we were talking, when we were preparing for this talk, it wasn't until like what 2007 we got rid of DRM. I think we looked that up yesterday. That's it's right. kind of amazing to think about that, and uh, which really freed people from being locked to a specific device and uh, and having to worry about rechecking it with their content and all this kind of stuff that you had to do. And you know, I guess I, you know, my little part of that was while the digital download business was developing CD ripping because most people had a CD collection was the thing and the CD database thing that we did, let iTunes recognize the CDs and then encode them and store them initially securely and eventually openly in your iPod. So I know that, you know, without us, 
there wasn't well there wasn't any itunes store there was liquid audio but there wasn't any itunes store for years and um, that's what made the ipod happen was convert your cd collection to portable files and uh, that went on for a long time and eventually digital downloads started to take off on itunes almost solely on itunes in a big way and I, quite frankly i was getting concerned because it was quite dominant you know that service and um Thankfully, uh, somewhere along there, uh, right around that 2008, 2006, 2008 timeframe, streaming platforms started to emerge. And that solved a lot of, of the issues for some users, especially for young users, because they didn't have a CD collection to rip. They didn't own anything. And they could just come in and experience all the music they wanted for a fee. That I think was appealing to people who didn't own CDs. It was not as appealing to me, the guy who had spent, you know, a house house worth of, uh, of money on CDs, which probably were still under my house and not worth very much these days. Um, it was hard to make that transition. And uh, you know, here we are in 2020, and now streaming is the primary form although there still are downloads and of course somehow vinyl never went away dick and is a vibrant business which is yeah, i know and i you know i once had about fifteen thousand pieces of vinyl but i guess i should have kept them all you know you know one of the new emerging businesses i just mentioned briefly which has nothing to do with digital is real real tapes people are collecting and rebuilding new I decks saw, and real I saw some 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 uh facebook group that was uh that was selling tapes from artists that i was the product manager for and had you know authorized their production <laughs> you know so like, you never know oh, what's going to come back from the past well yeah, i thought we well, might maybe we should talk a little dick about about you know now i think we're about halfway through let's talk about what's you know what's happening today and then we'll talk a little about the future maybe yeah, let's, well let's talk about some of the things that we're working on now that are current um now you've been working with uh, Title, I know, yeah. and um, why don't you tell us about that? So, yeah, so the so you know basically when I went to Universal Music, the main thing that I latched on to there was that they were they were already working on before I got there, but they were working on high resolution audio that they had the files, they had the capability, and what they were really after was the idea that streaming services would have more than one price point that you would have like a small medium and large like other products you would have a basic you would have a deluxe and then you might have a super high-end version and that didn't really exist we had still and we still to a large extent today have a kind of a one size fits all model for premium services you know and there was radio and there was all that kind of stuff but i wasn't interested in that i was interested in how do i get the top 20% of the users to pay more for something that's better. How can I make, can we actually have something that's better? Noticing that bandwidth was no longer a big issue and like seemed like we could at least have CD quality. <laughs> Why about that? Can we get back to CD quality? Maybe we can do better than that. And so when I was at Universal, Tidal was the service that jumped on this along with MQA, which is the master quality audio files. And I work with both these companies today and they were my guys. They were the guys that did it, you know, and, uh, and it was not possible to to the other services were like look we don't want to have a confusing message we don't want to necessarily charge more we want to get everybody in the planet using streaming and then later we'll figure it all out and um uh and so the reality is is that that's still a little bit like how it is today and there are a number of services now amazon and others have introduced this but title continues to be the guys that have the master quality audio and focus on this and now i think they've got more users and more revenue for the company coming from that tier than the regular tier. And that's an amazing accomplishment because, uh, you know, this would seem like a, when I was there, you know, I hear all these stories, oh, high-res audio, it's a niche thing. I was like, it's not high-res audio, it's just better sounding audio. <laughs> CD, CDs sound better, we can do CDs. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it was so hard to convince people uh, to uh, care about this, you know, because we had been used to, well, you know, these yeah. little guys, these little earbuds, you know, earbuds. okay, man, yeah. I got well, it. It's all about well, portability. One of the things that I'm working on is comes from a, from a different angle. Um, one of my current clients is a company called Audible Reality and, and that, and they have a mobile app that offers uh, music fans a, a pretty groundbreaking form of personalized listening that allows real time control of a song mix through what they call vibes and, and that enables an unlimited 
a uh, number of ways to experience a song while streaming and that it, it works like Instagram. You, it's as easy as flipping through through filters like you do for a photo. Um, and it, it works like this. You authentic, you download the app, you authenticate and can stream music from Spotify. There are other DSPs that are about to be announced, one another major one in a couple of weeks. And, and you can also play your local music for those that still have, you know, iTunes, uh, MP3s or whatever. And, and they, the uh, value prop for artists is they can create and release custom branded vibes for promotion or sale uh, in the Audible Reality Player. And there's a plugin that's about to be released that allows them to do that and, and have a dashboard to publish and, and um, get uh, analytics. And so that, that, uh, that uh, plugin is, is is available for pre-order now so it's it's a you know it's not it's not about anything like has nothing to do with the bit rate right. or or the, the it's all about everybody listens hears music differently that's why people some people like different headphones you know sure. that's really the only way that, that people are able to customize the sound right now is by the choice of headphones so this yeah, allows you to do it on a, a, in, an, in an app. I mean, I think those kind of technologies, which, so basically what people are doing is personalizing the listening experience. Mm -hmm. And there's all kinds of new stuff. There's, you know, 360 degree sound, there's Dolby Atmos, there's, you know, um, people looking at uh, how to, you know, put the room back in the recording virtually. There's uh, quite a quite a array of these things, which people like. And people like different ones, and those choices should be there. Again, this is one of the challenges I have with, you know, music services in general is there aren't a lot of options for the consumers to choose these things. There aren't plugins that let them do these things. There aren't, you know, where in other businesses, video games being one of them, there's tons of plugins, there's tons of audio, you know, all kinds of different things. It would be beneficial, I think, to the industry if there was more ability to innovate, because small companies could get in there and make something cool and that you may not have thought of. And um, mm -hmm. so I'd love to have a more open ecosystem for audio and music, that would be really great. And uh, you know, there is a company called Rune, which I'm very sure you guys are aware of, and they have built something like this. And uh, so, you know, it does exist, it can be done. And, uh, you know, I'm always interested in how music's gonna evolve. And, you know, I, and it really hasn't evolved too much, frankly, in the last uh, 10 years, it's been pretty similar. And it seems like we could go on a couple different axes, like the axis of quality of sound or personalization, or maybe, you know, audio visual information. Heaven forbid we would have anything to look at. Uh, well, that's probably a good segue into, um, <laughs> you know, into live streaming, uh, which you're intricately involved with, with, with your new company. So why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, I mean, I think Fantrax is the company that I've been involved with. And so really this is um, the way I want to look at it is, is that obviously there's been a lot of artists who have been experimenting in video before there was, they really like doing all these live streams that they're doing now and visual albums, you know, like it's kind of back to what I was doing with David Bowie and Peter Gates. It's like artists, that, many artists think more than just musically. They have a look, they have a, they have people they know that can do visuals if they don't do it themselves. They wanna act in it, they wanna create something that's, and they do it today for music videos, but they haven't really been able to do that too well for their um, live concert business because the shows are designed for arenas and it's a whole different kind of metaphor. But what we've been doing is basically uh, finding artists who want to do a live stream and putting an incredible visual behind them. And you can see in the picture behind me, that's actually the stage that we set up for the Goo Goo Doll show. We did this last, uh, well, two weeks ago. And when we do these shows now, we do a live stream with visuals for the band. And then on the second day or right after the live stream, we record a concept album for them. So they do two products at once. And that concept album has to be something that's thematic and something that's visual. My partner, Barry Summers, he's the, uh, creative engine behind these things and he works with the band to create the experience for them and this is usually something very new and what's exciting about it is is that a lot of these artists have ideas that they can explore in this arena and it's a combination of live performance and recording and visuals in, for example these concept albums aren't necessarily all stream live there's something that involved 3d graphics augmented reality 
The stage behind me is a giant LED floors, walls, the band can fly in outer space or visit the moon or whatever you want them to do. And somebody has to think of all that stuff and then realize, help them realize that. So that's been a big, you know, my job, you know, if you want to get like summary of my job, summary of my job is I help put the technology in place to realize the dreams of the artists and try to realize them in a way that that is achievable. And then I need creative people who, like my partner Barry, who can work on top of that platform and work with the artist to actually fashion it into a finished product, just like you did, Dick, when you were a producer. Mm -hmm. So you've got to have all those pieces. And um, to me, a live stream is a lot more than just, you know, four guys on a stage with a microphone. It's it's four guys on a stage with a microphone with an idea. Well, that's that, you know, the we've gone the 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 arc of live streaming from the beginning of COVID till now is, is, is pretty dramatic. I think, you know, when we first went it down, you know, everything went down, everybody was just sitting on their couch and strumming guitars and, you know, just putting their iPhones in front of their, on top of their pianos and whatever. And, and, you know, that's still going on and that I, it works for certain kinds of artists, but, you know, I think that that got somewhat boring quickly, and now we're we're in another uh, another stage of development, dramatically different, where artists are trying out different types of uh, mingling, different types of media, whether it's animation or it's live within a game, um, and uh, you know, uh, different kinds of uh, VR and AR, and so I I think that. I guess what's going to be interesting is what what kind of what kind of mixed realities that we end up with that become <laughs> that become you know kind of de rigueur you know that I don't think we know yet because once there is actually live music again on stage, God willing, um, you know what I have a feeling that we may never go back to what it was that there's going to be a, 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 a you know a, a balance between. Uh, Performances that are done virtually versus um, in in theaters and arenas around the state around the country because and they may be geo fenced. Uh, it may be it may not be financially feasible to to play in every small market uh, yeah. any longer. Uh, you know? I, I'm very excited about it, Dick. I think I think the main thing is we're just in the early stages of this. You know this stage that's behind me or whatever that I you know we built two weeks ago is like a trans it's like the holodeck you know so okay we now have the holodeck what are we going to do with it and you know these artists presented with this and with you know barry's creativity can start to think about things we're just at the beginning and we're really excited about the projects we're working on in the future what the visuals are going to be what the audio is going to be how the fan interaction because another big part of this is these guys can't perform in a vacuum in a warehouse to like me and the audio tech you know this is this is, they need to feel the fans there. So we bring the fans in kind of on visuals and on Zoom and things like that. So they can feel fan presence. They can hear the sound of the fans. And the whole idea is to get a great performance and also to to facilitate the, what happens in a live show, the fan interaction. And so it's, these are all very, very new. You can see it's being done for sporting events as well, obviously mm -hmm. basketball, but they have crowds of people in there that are all virtual. So that interaction is, key and um and then i think the bands have to learn this is a new art because they're performing essentially for television so you know if you want to think of it that way okay maybe they're performing inside of a vr world if it's a vr thing that's way different than performing for an arena you know like in an arena you know you got to run around the stage because you're creating motion on the stage you're doing big gestures to talk to the people in the back on television, you know, it's a lot more subtle and you're playing to the camera that's in front of you and you want to move around a little bit, but you don't need to run across the stage because it's actually hard for the camera to track you. So so learning how to perform for that and do a whole show and then have all the visuals and everything else. And maybe you have to do some if you want it to be beyond music. In the case of this uh, Goo Goo Dolls, we're doing a Christmas special, which has them doing acting and other guest performers coming in and they're in virtual environments. So that's like making a little mini musical movie product, like it's a VR AR mus musical, you know. That's that's well, that's a new about, form. You're working, you know, it it dawns on me that for young developing acts that have not been able to get out on the road, 
and that's where you learn your trade. When you're, a, when you're a young band and you're trying out material and you're trying out arrangements, you rely on the crowd's response to help shape your sound. And this year, those bands couldn't, couldn't do that. So it's, it's all well and good for established bands to be able to figure out how to block and you know, yeah. blocking and tackling for, for but, but for young bands, th this has been a sort of a lost year in terms of, in terms of real craft live stage craft development. So I, 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 we'll see how that, that plays out over the long run. But I, I want to also um, talk holistically now about, uh, you, know, where mu you know, where music creation is going, um, because I think it's, it's really vital. We, you, know, you and I grew up in, a, in, a, in an era where most music was recorded in a recording studio that was professionally manned and professionally equipped. And uh, it was a somewhat uh, insulated experience in that, uh, I should say isolated experience. There were a, a, bunch, a few musicians would come in you know, from a band uh, and, and the producer might bring in outside arranger or might bring in an outside uh, instrument, you know, even a string section or whatever. But for the most part, it was, it was self-contained. And now we're in an era where where music is 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 a collaboration. Most of the records that are that are on the charts today are are collaborations that that where you know the music has been passed around via being collaborate you know with with various tools that range from you know SoundCloud to Audio Bridge to you know you know uh, there's just so many of them I can't even remember all. Uh, that and different sections of songs are vetted, and we're talking about uh, easy access to to plugins and to equipment. And so, wh who is the musician? To what is a musician today? <laughs> you know, what, yeah. What you know? What is a producer today? They're 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 you know a producer day a producer today is taking bits of songs and farming them out, and maybe you know try to. Uh, Get someone to write one one verse. Uh, it's it's a it's a very different. Uh, uh, it couldn't be more different from the era that I grew up making records in. I mean, there is one thing that that's good is because of the technology we have, that creative process can go on even in COVID isolation. Really, people are able to do this pretty completely, so that's good. The bad part is is that it's. Um, uh, it's changed the craft quite a bit, and it, and I think you know depends on what kind of musician you are. Maybe you're a musician who doesn't use any of those technology components. You're more like an Ed Sheeran type guy, and you basically write songs and play a guitar and sing. So so the question is, how do you get the support you need online, and what can you do? I I feel like technology has always been a tool, but ultimately it's the creativity of the individual that shines through whatever technology they have, and. Uh, I kind of felt like, you know, I could still be creative with uh, paper and pencil if I had to be. And uh, uh, I feel like these tools can accelerate the process and bring more people into it. You're right. When you look at popular music now, there's 10 writers, maybe more on some of the publishing lines. And most people provide a little bit of the music in some way, some feedback and somehow are in there. And uh, that's really different than, you know, two people on there uh you know jagger richards you know from the past and uh i guess it's it's going to become a whole different thing and you know as we were talking about the future yesterday a little bit this collaboration is going to now expand to the fans themselves or to other people that the band doesn't really know because these tools right now they're using amongst their close-knit team but other musicians are using open tools and putting things openly on the internet that anyone can make things with and then taking ideas from that and putting it into their music so that collaborative fan band you know third man third woman you know out there that they don't even know i think that's the future for not every form of music but for a certain portion yeah we're already seeing the the that there's real money in sound packs uh that you know splice just announced that they paid out 11 million dollars in royalties in the first nine months of, of 2020 um, as an example, right? And, and you have Lander and, and others that are doing the same thing and um, track lib. But I think that in the next step beyond sound packs, 
is, is something that I've been working on for a number of years and, and you and I have talked about, uh, which is the unbundling of the song uh, in the form of stems. And so, and sound source separation via AI is becoming better and better. So, so you know, right now you can use AI, you know, companies like Audionamics can, can pull out a vocal or do a, a karaoke track or a bass or drums track without going back to the original tapes. And eventually you'll be able to pull out guitars and you know, all that is coming with the, and with the, with tick, with the TikToks and thrillers of the world, it, there's an enormous opportunity in my opinion to monetize these things. The record companies are sitting on the uh, assets that can be broken down into bigger assets into just as they did with in a, with ringtones was basically a, a child of a song, right? Well, so are stems, and and that's we're going to licensing is still a, an issue. Um, so, you know the the tra tracking tracking usage, and uh, you know those are all things that are holding back that market. But I think I think we're going to get there. Yeah, I I feel like that that is going to be so. Of course. Me also, I've been working on stems a long time and it was one of the products that when I was in the universe, I thought would be like just around the corner, but it turns out it's hard because of the, there's like a couple things that are a challenge. One is the integrity of the original recording and the artist's, you know, view that I don't want my thing disassembled into pieces, you know, you can understand that, you know, you too, if you take Bono out of it, you know, okay, it's like some guys backing the, the, the band, maybe I put myself in instead of Bono, I don't know how the band feels, I don't know how he feels about it, he's not even in there. So the reality is that that has slowed this down a bit, where it's been picking up steam is in the areas like you mentioned, electronic music and sample packs and these kind of things are starting to be developed. And, um, you know, if you just focus on, you know, rhythm and bass, drums and you know electronic sounds you can start to build libraries up that are that are licensable and usable that's kind of what splice is doing and yeah. i i hope that this can evolve more quickly i think it will enable if you've already enabled a lot of people to do it just through sampling i mean this is the honest truth is you know a lot of popular music has samples you know a lot of them come from the stacks record collection you know hopefully people can figure out that you use the stacks sample and then they can get paid for it. But if you actually had these stems properly done, properly watermarked, properly distributed, we wouldn't have to have a secret about what the mixture is. We'd have to figure out a formula for how they're going to compensate it, but you could at least know what the cake mix was. And uh, all those things are still coming. And uh, I do believe it's kind of happening no matter what. So the question is, how fast will it happen? Who will embrace it? Who will put up a big catalog of works to be used in this way? And then somebody will make something successful out of it. And then everyone will go, oh, well, that's what we should do. But we still have a little ways to go with that. Uh, you know, it's rumored for the future still. I, I think it, by 2025, this is all going to be worked out. <laughs> you know, um, somebody asked in the, uh, in, the, in the chat, you know, what, what, they, what, what we see as the, the, the future of, the, of streaming. And, you know, one of, one of the things that, that you and I talked about, you know, when we were prepping was... Uh, you know, the, the, the sort of what we think of as a, the, the standard streaming product, meaning what Spotify, Apple, Amazon, and, and everybody are, you know, trying to gain market share from each other. It's, it's somewhat of a mature business at this point, as, as it is. And so we look, you know, this is why you have these, even today, you have a massive uh, uh, acquisition by Spotify in the podcast uh, business, which is where right. you know, they're looking to grow ways of growing the business that are not, you know, that are now, you know, outside of their initial focus. So, you know, we, I think you're going to see these companies start to add on extra features that will be increment have incremental costs whether it's premium podcasts or premium concerts or whatever. Yes. So uh, the, I guess what I'm saying is that I, I, that the future for these companies, in my opinion, is, is in bundling and in trying to come up with ways to satisfy the biggest fans because the biggest fans are the, they're the whales and they're the ones that'll pay for anything. Yeah. I, I, so first of all, 
this is a natural situation of how these businesses need to grow. They need to figure out a way to create new revenue streams and grow their audience of their core revenue stream because otherwise they can't afford to add additional content. You know, the problem we have, as we all know, with streaming services is that the margins for the business are, you know, fairly evenly divided between the content companies and the services. And there's just not a lot of headroom in there to do a lot more stuff. So if you want to create premium podcasts, you're going to have to have a separate fee for that or somehow it's sense and pull. There's no reason that music services, which is where all the music consumers are, why don't they have, you know, music documentaries? Why am I looking for music documentaries on Netflix? And, and by the way, their organization music is terrible. So why That's a would really I... That's a really good point. That's a really you good know, point. You know, it's like... Seems why aren't there original documentaries around music artists that are the most popular on Spotify or on other services on Tidal? Well, they do do some, but the problem really is that 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 model that they have right now, which is everyone all you can eat for nine ninety nine or whatever, doesn't allow for these additional things. And so, so actually, what's needed is the ability to have market segmentation, additional add-on features, and and probably different price points. And if you do that, wow. then you can start thinking about what gets into those other tiers. And um, the other area I would say is most all of the functionality for music applications right now is uh, audio. And, you know, I've you know, heard for years, music on a phone is an in-pocket experience, you know, like, so I play the music and I put it in my pocket, <laughs> I put it in my earbuds. So there's no reason to have visuals, nobody looking at that. But, you know, when I walk around town, I see everyone looking at their screen to the point where they're running into each other. So the question is, why can't we have, you know, why am I only looking at one photograph of an artist? This has been a problem for 20 years. It's like artists are all about how they look. What about where they live? What about who they hang out with? What about the scene that they're in? What are the clubs they played at? What are, where's the videos? Why can we not have a multi a visual product for music? Why does music musicians are so much about their world and who they are and how they look and who they hang out with and what they have to say. We only hear them as sound. And so, you know, that, is another area that obviously could be dealt with. Like who's reaching out to all the photographers and trying to get them, oh, wait, Vince Bannon, he's on here. Well, somebody like Vince Bannon will do that. But the idea <laughs> is- he's, that, on, he's on here. Yeah, I saw him on there. So, so the reality and, and, is, is and, that- And in the same way, it's like, why do I have, why, why when I'm listening to whatever, Bruce Springsteen on, on uh, Spotify, why, is, why isn't there an easy way to find the podcasts that He's tagged in, you know. I mean, yeah. I, I'm working with a, a company called Pantheon Podcast Network, and they're, they're they build themselves as the podcast network for music lovers. It's it's all it's all music shows focused on history and interviews and commentary and news and books and films that, that are music centric. And you know, they have 50 shows, right? Um, I shouldn't have to, you know, I, that I imagine that someday living inside of a, a music service. Uh, uh, right. They're, 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 interestingly, they've also created an, an, uh, an alliance of music podcasters because the thing, the one thing that's holding back music podcasting is the license. You can't play full songs, um, and so there's now a you know a podcast alliance whose mission is to you know move those discussions forward in, in terms of licensing and fair use and copyright and takedowns, et cetera. So. I thought I would mention that. And, you know, in reverse from what we're talking about, you have the gaming platforms, you know, why, you know, why wouldn't they have, you know, a full assortment of music opportunities within the gaming platform, which of course is you have the Amazon, uh, Amazon Twitch uh, marriage that uh, may, you know, they're trying to make it work, but there's a lot of licensing issues there too. But ultimately, you know, Things can, everything can be resolved if, if licenses can be resolved. Yeah, I think that video game platforms, already musicians are using those platforms to reach huge audiences. Kind of when we're talking about the live streaming stuff, people have done these big events with those. They have huge audiences and those audiences do care about music and certain sets of musicians. And so it has great possibility, but that the monetization and the broad monetization of music within those platforms hasn't occurred yet. And and um, uh, I think that that can be changed. You know, I think we'll see with these new Xbox and PlayStation platforms, what you can really do with music. You know, I know that there's uh, integration in there of music services and they can, be, they can be played in the background. And, um, sorry about that. That damn phone. 
Yeah, yeah, sure. It's a game. Uh, yeah. Well, they, you know, we're 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 in a uh, we're in a period now where it's we have. They, I I forgot how many live streams there are per per week. I think bands in town put out a number that was. I just can't remember, but it was startling. And so there, you know, there's, there seems to be a lot of, I mean, coming back to the live side, there's a lot of creativity. I think that's where we're going to see uh, a lot of hybrids going forward. Um, and, and it's exciting to be, to be a part of it. You're, you're right in the middle of it. And, and uh, so both from, a, you know, to kind of wrap that uh, we have, we have such creativity going on in the, in the world of live performance. And we have a lot of creativity going on in the world of, of creation. Um, and so I think COVID is, 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 is sort of the beginning of, of the next stage because everyone was home and trying to think, trying to think of ways to be, be creative. And, yes. and yeah, you know, so a musician may not have to, may not be able to read, write, or, or play music. Um, they might not even be able to play, a, you know, they might not, even if they play, they might not play a traditional instrument. They might be creating music via AI. We didn't even talk about that. Right. You know, um, <laughs> and, uh, you know. Well, that's, you know, that's good that we're going to be have things to do for the next, you know, 10 years. I mean, I, I do think AI will become more and more important. And you're right. Already this is happening. I mean, I know successful musicians who do not really play the instrument in real time. But they have successful careers and um, uh, they have creative ideas, you know, and creativity, you know, combined with technology can, you know, it's not a it's not a replacement for skills, but it is an alternative. And so I think it's all about how do we best empower? You know, that's my job. My job is, you know, I'm I don't know, I'm Scotty mixed with Captain Kirk for artists. You know, I'm, yeah, I tell you yeah. when the lithium crystals are about to blow and uh I try to, you know, <laughs> hold the shields together while we're trying to broadcast a show. And the idea is, it's their ideas. I just am there to, to, you know, make the transmission go well and make it possible. And, you know, I think you've been supporting all of these new initiatives and new technologies that you work with. Same thing. Those are entrepreneurs that we support. We really do. We just well, support these. That, yeah, somebody said, and, and I, I, geez, you know, you, you spent so many years marketing and, and making records and developing artists, and then you moved to the tech side. What, what's the thread? And I said, it's really all about, about you know, try, talent. It's like, I, I, yeah. I, I just became, I just wanted to bring, I've always wanted to, to help develop talent and bring it to the world, whether it was a musician or, or whether it was a, an entrepreneur with a great idea. And that hasn't changed since since uh, I was in college, and I feel very lucky to have had the opportunity to do that time and time again, and to work with other visionaries like yourself and and many of the people that I see that are you know in the chat here and attending, and I, I do appreciate everyone coming to hear us talk because I think we're getting a signal from Tom that we're supposed to wrap. Tom, how much time do we have? You guys can carry on a little bit longer. I think the audience right. is certainly enjoying it and benefiting from it, so please do. Yeah, let's look at a few uh, questions here, Dick. Maybe we can just look at look at it here, and yeah. um, you know, there's quite a few interesting comments there. Let's, and uh, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I, Lisa, Lisa Farris, hi, Lisa. She said, uh, "Ty, how is that music often that music often less in its digital format than in physical?" What is the music often less, and it's just, I guess, less appealing, less, less uh, uh, satisfactory? Well, you know, I guess I would just say the initial conversion of physical media to digital was about making it portable and making it small so you could take an iPod, which I don't remember how much storage was on the first iPod, uh, anyways. Well, know, I remember the, the very first portable device, the, the Rio, held, held uh, 30 meg. I was gonna say like it was a 50 meg or 100. 30. so 30 okay so the idea was a thousand songs in your pocket okay well you divide that up each song is pretty small and so but it was so cool to have a thousand songs and you were listening to them through these little things and so that you know that works great but the problem is is that what people didn't realize is they they had gone from cds which were actually pretty high quality to something that was far less than that 
they noticed it. They noticed it, but they only noticed it mostly in their cars. Because once you had the iPod and you had portability, the other thing that kind of went away for a long time was like the home stereo system. You know, Dick and I are from the era when you had like, you know, and I still have this somewhere in my house downstairs, big speakers and this whole setup in my house where I listen to all these things. And uh, that kind of went away. And it, and frankly, if you think about time going on, you move to the future and it turns into a mono Alexa speaker in your kitchen. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no. All right. So, all right. So we've gone from, you know, pretty high end system. Most people had, they had a high five. It was called that in your house. And then to the mono speaker, thankfully, you know, Netflix and televisions and the electronics companies developed this wonderful technology, which was acceptable to my spouse called the sound bar. And it allowed me to have stereo sound in my living room at a high quality eventually with a large screen. So suddenly in the living room, I have a good system again. And uh, music didn't really do that. Movies did that and TV yeah. shows that we watch, you know. And, you know, here in COVID, you know, I have a 20-year-old son. And the 20-year-old son previously would hide out in his bedroom on his iPad and listen to music. And eventually some of these streaming shows became of interest to him. And then eventually he moved to the living room. And eventually he discovered that we had a sound bar and a sound system. It was incredible. He was like, oh, wow, why does it sound so much better? <laughs> I was like, it's called speakers. It's incredible. Yeah, this is new well, technology. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, so, uh, Ted Utz was asking if the NFL can translate to a big screen and surround sound, why can't music? And, yeah. you know, it's, I think you're right. We have a generation of people who are used to listening on like this and not used to listening. Or we grew up listening in rooms with like the. That was our thing, right? So it's it's just a culture that... You know, good news is their headphone technology has improved a lot. So actually, you can get good quality audio if you need to be in headphones. Headphones is good for COVID because you're in a house now. With, you know, yeah. We got everybody in one room, essentially. But the reality is uh, uh, physical media in the past, you know, quality was like one of the biggest things that people cared about. And it's coming back. So we're all working on it. You know, it's there. And in different markets, it's really popular. This is, you know, what the MQA company, Master Quality Eyes, about. it's about. Actually, it's not just about quality. It's about knowing that the sound you're listening to was treated properly all the way back to the master. Because I don't want to realize this, but somewhere in the middle of that digital era, you know, a lot of the people lost track of the actual, to call it tape to file process that you listen to. And some files got doubly recompressed. Some weren't handled that great, you know. So everyone's noticed this. Like you listen to different things in the streaming service, and you go, oh, "That sounds really good." And this one doesn't sound as good. Yeah, I, and, I'm I, I'm out. I jog a few times a week, and sometimes I will. The difference between one song to the next is so dramatic that you know it literally uh, you would know that it was coming from the same service. And, and so, so we still in, we still have that. And you're right, a lot of those records that I'm hearing that are like that, they were never properly mastered for digital. No, I mean, if people understood the history of that, when things were first converted to digital, many were done for using, uh, this before computers could even really look at a waveform like on the screen, like now they can look at it very precisely and have tools and go, okay, how to do it. They had like these little like LED meters on the Sony digital recorders. And those guys at that time said, hey, when it goes in the red, it's clipping, don't let it go there. So people would like get into the yellow and if it touched the red, but that only used about 70% of the signal. So right there, you threw away like 30% because you were worried because you couldn't control it. Mm -hmm. We don't have that problem today, but a lot of those things are still the files we have if nobody went back and fixed them. And so, you know, over time, the artists themselves, other people, smart people have said, hey, can you really listen to this? album and you know we read about these things but quality is a continuous process it's not a process where suddenly everything in the world is better quality and um it's a, well, i think it's important well one thing that has improved is you know there are more and more lyrics available to to look at while streaming you know, some of them are you know yeah uh, they sync and imagine some of, that some of, who would want to know the lyrics right? and you know <laughs> credits is still, you know, there's still credits. Uh, oh, and Robert Sandman just said, and lyric translations are coming. Um, and, uh, you know, album credits, while they may not be essential to everyone, they are essential to some people. And there's, you know, there's more and more of those, more, more of the, the, the package that we used to have 
where the packaged product is, is finally, finally, what are, what are we, 25 years later, as finally becoming, you know, more, more and more available. Um, it's taken a long time. Yeah, the, the credits thing, you know, so, so Tidal has very detailed credits. They worked on it for like yes. years. And, you know, at the company, people were like, who cares about this? This is, you know, who, it's only the nerds care about who the whatever. It's like one of the most popular features in the service. <laughs> but they only knew that after they did it. And it turns out possibly because of what we were talking about, how songs were written today, the kids today want to know who produced the song, who provided the sample, what other things has that person done things on? And, and they can only do that. You know, these things are hot linkable. So you just click on their name and it comes up with the other songs they're in. That's a great feature. And that helps those people and that helps them understand music better. And so credits is a great one. You know, I'm, I, I'm hoping that, uh, uh, photography is next. That would be really nice. I want to see some pictures and, uh, you know, the credits in the past were on the album, on the albums, you know, they were on the back, you know, and I'm one of the guys that was in there talking to Steve Jobs about album covers. And he told me, I only need the front. I don't need the back. And, uh, uh, and we never did the back because it was, we just didn't need that information in the system. So unfortunately that's where that information was. Well, uh, one, of, one, of, one of the things that the, uh, the record companies, uh, basically, they owned the front cover, you know, and, and they, that's all they ever put in their agreements, generally with the, uh, with the, with the art directors or the photographers. So that, that's one of the reasons, you know, a lot of times that if you want the back cover, you have to negotiate directly or the inner the sleeve photos, you have to negotiate directly with i guess vince spanner could really answer that yeah we found out about that we're getting some recent projects it's yeah so i'm hoping that these things can be come alive in the future you know one thing that's a challenge i'm just concerned about is there's a whole era of photographers from the 60s and the 50s and frankly they're they're not going to be around that much longer these guys from these guys and i worry that their photographs are not organized and tagged and in databases and i don't want them to be lost um mm -hmm. and so i hope that we can get these into products at some point soon just so there'll be a focus down on getting these things and getting these archives and getting in there and capturing what is in my opinion some of the most you know fundamental parts of music is the life and times of the artist and it's visual great well um Nick, I'm afraid see. it's time for us to wrap. Oh, okay. I was um, looking for another question, but no, uh, I, I, I very I'll take, much. I'll take your cue. Well, I appreciate that. We're a little bit over time, but uh, just on behalf of the audience, let me simply say high five to you and Ty. This has been awesome. I thank you both thank for you. your time and your expertise, your wisdom, and it's just really been great. So thank you to thank the audience. You. Um, I want to say come back on Thursday and Friday this week at the same time. On Thursday, we're featuring David Hazen and Richard Goderer, which is going to, be going to be a... That's going to be a good one. I know them both well and their neighbors, and that's going to be a good one. No kidding. It's going to be fun. And then Friday, we've got a very special treat. Frank Zappa's son, Amit Zappa, and Bill Gubbins, who is... One of Another the good inside one. photographers in the Zappa world are going to be talking about the upcoming d documentary about Zappa's life, as well as Bill's book called The Hot Rats. Hot Rats uh, book. Yeah, Ahmet will be able to talk about all about photography and the use of it and the books and all the things he's putting together and Invinium and these different companies he's working with. It's He's the man for realizing how to get that stuff accessible. He so. sure is. So let me say one final note to everyone out there. Be nice to one another. Wear a mask. And it's a bright new day in the country. So hey, we'll Tom, see you soon. I, hey, Tom, I just, I just want to give you a shout out because you are doing a fantastic job of programming. We can, I mean, multiple times a week. And it's really uh, been, been the, the most engaging of all, the, of all the, uh, these type of events during, during COVID. So hats off to you. Well, thank you. I'm having fun doing it. Uh, I get to rub elbows with rock stars like you and Ty Roberts. How could that oh. not be awesome? Oh, man. <laughs> Thanks uh, a lot, Tom. You were awesome for to host this, and uh, I you. look forward to coming back and, and uh, continue the discussion. Thanks a lot. Right on, boys. Bye, Cheers. everybody. Bye-bye.